Hi, dense friends, and welcome to the Dense Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoyne. And I'm Cadence Neenan. We are editors at Dance Media, and in today's episode, which is actually our 50th episode, which is kind of bonkers, we will be talking about the findings of the Paris Opera's new diversity report and the ways the institution has promised to act on those findings. We'll discuss the creative wilds of ballet TikTok and how TikTok is becoming a space for dancers to have honest conversations about the problems they see in ballet. We'll talk a little about the dancing that happened during the weekend's Super Bowl halftime show and the internet's various reactions to that dancing. And then we'll have our interview with Tamisha Guy, who is a standout dancer with Kyle Abraham's AIM, and she's also a thoughtful dance educator and creative. Tamisha talked about her plans to start financial literacy workshops for dancers because that is a skill set that is so important for anyone embarking on a professional career, but that's missing from a lot of dancers' toolboxes. And then we also talked about how we can use this COVID time to make the dance world a better and more equitable and inclusive place for the next generation of dancers coming up. So we're really excited for you to hear her perspective. But before we get into all of that, we want to pause for a minute and discuss a conversation that's been happening on Instagram involving our sister publication, Dance Magazine. And we talk a lot on this podcast about the importance of dance institutions holding themselves accountable. And this is a moment where we need to apply that same standard to our own organization. So here's what happened in broad outline. On February 5th, dance artist and writer Bria Bacon, she's at B-R-I-A-B-A-C-O-N on Instagram, posted an open letter to Dance Magazine critiquing its February issue, which during Black History Month had no Black visibility on its cover. And shortly afterward, Dance Magazine posted a collage of past covers on its own Instagram account, not addressing Bria's statement, but instead saying that the magazine, quote, is committed to showcasing the breadth of diversity in the dance field and supporting anti-racism all year long, end quote. Within hours, the magazine removed that post, but you can still see it reposted on Bria's account, along with her response to Dance Magazine's aborted response. And Bria has since posted another letter, this one addressed to Dance Magazine editor-in-chief Jennifer Stahl. And we'll link to all of Bria's statements in the episode description. But we also want to read her first letter in full. So here it is. To Dance Magazine. February is Black History Month, 28 days governmentally instated into American calendars to reflect, remind, commune, encourage, teach, and learn the importance of Black history as it is synonymous with the chronological catalog of this country. It is 28 days handed to us dripping with tokenism and silencing that we Black Americans have reclaimed as a month of joy, education, and reparation. Yet many American organizations and figureheads stall to acknowledge and honor Black people, Black spaces, and Black contributions that show up in every job field, on every screen, in every conversation. When fear of minimization takes hold, rarely is the time found inside insecurity to show gratitude and commemoration. Within spaces that we amass the most, like the arts, education, sports, Black invisibility finds its shining moments. Being that I am a performing artist, my gaze specifically engages with the arts and questions how its, quote, leaders, unquote, can implement ceremonies, opportunities of recognition for Black makers. One of the largest publications in the dance field is Dance Magazine, yet February's cover has found itself devoid of Black mention. Upon seeing this month's issue, I immediately felt unseen and consequently sought out my community to ground my reactions and discuss their own. On the one hand, I was affirmed in knowing my feelings weren't overstated and were collective. On the other, I was disheartened by our group expectation of Dance Magazine, which is the push for white bodies. What is the future of Black visibility? Moreover, will young Black girls and boys ever receive the representation in dance they need? If we show no concern for our children, then our hopes for the future subsequently deflate. Do we not see that? Not only did this month's cover decide to center whiteness during the one month slated for our shine, but it spotlighted a ballerina while in the role of Odette from Swan Lake, a ballet that took until 2014 to showcase a Black female lead, parentheses, because ballet never intended to include Black bodies in the lane of, quote, sophisticated dance, unquote, and parentheses. 
Nowhere on the cover was there mention of the many spotlighted Black artists inside, parentheses, like Missy Robinson, whose article was written and photographed by Black women, Jamil Olawale Kosako, Tanisha Scott, Kia Smith, and parentheses, or a directive to read a Black his slash her slash their story in general. Even though it comes without surprise, demands for awareness hold the power for change. I ask that Dance Magazine not let another February issue go out that is not beholden by melanin, honoring Black contribution, swollen with Black thought. There are too many brilliant Black makers in a variety of positions, parentheses, i.e. theory, performance, critique, witness, dramaturgy, design, management, and parentheses, within this field to allow for 12 issues centering whiteness in a year's span. Better can be done because what we have is unacceptable. In February, Blackness demands the spotlight. Sincerely, Bria Bacon. So, Dance Magazine issued an apology on Instagram on Tuesday. But we, and the we I'm using here is Dance Media, the parent organization that includes both Dance Magazine and the Dance Edit, we failed here. This was a failure. And I know that apologies like this are always going to ring hollow. What I hope is that we, and now this is not some anonymous we, but we, the people talking to you on this podcast, I hope that we can live an apology through the content that we create. We need to actually live the principles written into the mission and value statement here at Dance Media, which says that we, quote, aspire to be as diverse as the dance community itself and to shine light on the injustices within and around it and to strive for a culture of fairness, respect, and inclusion. That's the work we need to do and that we need to do better. So, Bria, I hear you, we hear you, and we thank you because it is not your job to hold us accountable, but the time and thought and labor that you put into these posts helps us do that work better. So listeners, we encourage you to go read all of Bria's posts. Again, we'll link to them in the episode description, or you can find them on her Instagram account at B-R-I-A-B-A-C-O-N. Okay. So bringing that spirit of doing better into the rest of the episode, we're going to move on to our usual dance headline rundown. And this week, it actually starts with some celebratory news. Yeah, so United States Artists announced its class of 2021 fellows, and we want to send a huge congratulations to dance recipients Ishmael Houston-Jones, John P. Starr, Emily Johnson, Cynthia Oliver, and Nigel Whitson, who each receive a $50,000 unrestricted grant. And I also love that United States Artists provides some financial advising programs to fellows. Um, unrestricted grants like this can be such huge game changers, especially to individual artists and helping them make the most of those funds is massively important all the time, but especially right now. Such a great program and such an extraordinary list of dancers. Congrats to all of them. The NAACP announced nominees for the 52nd annual NAACP Image Awards, a celebration of Black stories and excellence in entertainment. Among the nominees was the ever-iconic Debbie Allen in the social justice impact category, alongside notables like April Ryan, LeBron James, Stacey Abrams, and Tamika Mallory. The awards will be held live on Saturday, March 27th, so be sure to tune in and cheer on Miss Allen. Debbie Allen, let's give her all the awards, please. I second without emotion. Uh, and as we celebrate Black History Month, one program you should definitely add to your watch list. Next Thursday, February 18th, Ronald K. Brown Evidence will be performing at New York City's Joyce Theater, a continuation of the company's 35th anniversary celebrations. The live-streamed mixed bill includes an excerpt from Brown's beloved masterpiece, Grace, as well as the more recent Mercy, a solo from One Shot, which was inspired by the life and work of noted Pittsburgh photographer Charles Teeny Harris, and the March duet from Brown's Lessons, set to a speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, World of Dance recently announced its new dance studio franchise program, but the marketing language used to announce the program struck a terrible chord with many members of the dance community. In the initial announcement, it was stated that the $16 billion dance industry is quote-unquote on hold, and that there is quote, no industry leader, end quote, ignoring the hard work that many dance teachers and studio owners have put in this year and years prior. After a widespread social media outcry, including a call by many to boycott the brand, World of Dance took down this language from its site and issued a formal apology crediting the remarkable work that community leaders have done both in the pandemic and well forever. Yeah, that is a 
complicated story. We will link to Dance Teacher's piece about that, which gets further into the details. Uh, Indigenous dance artist Emily Johnson accused Jebediah Wheeler, the executive director of Montclair State University's Office of Arts and Cultural Programming, of verbal abuse. This was in an open letter to the National Endowment for the Arts, in which she stated that she had decided to forego, quote, any funding and further entanglements with peak performances, end quote, which had received a $25,000 grant from the NEA in support of a residency and project development that was under discussion when Johnson says Wheeler made comments that were, quote, specifically aimed to demean and make lesser me, my work, my heritage, and my ethics, end quote. Professors and former employees of the school are rallying around Johnson, while the university has since released a statement in support of Wheeler. Uh, This is a very complex story. Politico did a great bit of reporting on it, which I believe Margaret is linking, and also her open letter is available to read on the internet. We'll link to both the letter and that Politico story with all of its excellent reporting in the episode description. Uh, Dance Data Project released another eye-opening report, this one examining the leadership in 45 of the top company-affiliated ballet schools across the country. The data revealed that, as is often the case in the ballet world, while women make up the majority of faculty at all levels, men are overrepresented in top leadership roles. So while women have greater employment overall at these schools, they are disproportionately hired into untitled positions when compared with their male counterparts. And according to new survey data, four out of 10 equity members in the UK feel that the Brexit deal will negatively impact their ability to find work in the industry after creative workers were excluded from the list of occupations benefiting from work permit free travel into the EU. 31% of those surveyed reported seeing casting calls that required EU passports, and 14% reported having been asked by their agent to confirm whether they have EU passports. In response, Equity is asking the UK government to amend the trade deal so that creative workers are included in the current arrangement or to create a separate creative visa. I have to say, after watching this unfold for the last several years, I'm completely unsurprised. Yeah, yet another completely dismaying and completely unsurprising facet of this Brexit mess. New York City Ballet announced the lineup for its upcoming 2021 digital season, including new works from choreographers Kyle Abraham and Justin Peck. The season is set to begin on February 22nd and will include performances, rehearsals, and conversations with the company and its dancers, all filmed at the David H. Koch Theater at Lincoln Center. The company's return to the Koch is another step towards the reopening of performing arts spaces to the public. Currently, City Ballet is still planning to stage a live season in the fall, conditions permitting, of course. Did you guys see that Taylor Stanley is in the cast for the Kyle Abraham piece? And so is KJ Takahashi. I'm really excited. It's gonna be good. More Taylor Stanley. Always, please. Every, always and everywhere. Honestly, Taylor Stanley and Kyle Abraham. It's just... Uh, That's the duo. Uh, In more City Ballet-related news, uh, Zeitgeist Films has acquired North American distribution rights to In Balanchine's Classroom, a film that's been in the works for a while, looking at Balanchine students from the 60s and 70s and examining the legacy of his teaching, including some reportedly never-before-seen archival footage of him in class and rehearsal. Uh, They're planning for a theatrical release this fall, beginning with an exclusive engagement at New York City's Film Forum before a wider release. I'm wondering when they say examining the legacy of his teaching, how deep that examining is going to go and if it's going to allow for any criticism. I'm very curious. I, I, have, I have the exact same curiosity, Margaret. We'll see. Linda Denise Fisher Harrell was named Artistic Director of Hubbard Street Dance Chicago, effective March 1st. Fisher Harrell will serve as only the fourth person to lead Hubbard Street in its history, and she'll be faced with the unique challenge of performing a sort of triage for the company after the pandemic halved the company's budget, forced staff layoffs, and catalyzed the closure of the Lou Conte Dance Studio. But Fisher Harrell is focused on finding a way to reconnect Hubbard Street with its audience in its upcoming 44th season. Yeah, I mean, I delighted by this appointment. I'm also admittedly a little concerned that uh, they just hired a black woman to essentially come in and clean up a massive mess. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, that's, it's concerning. Um, Yeah. So speaking of companies that, like Hubbard Street, are hoping to make a fresh start, 
In our next segment, let's talk about the Paris Opera, because at the beginning of the week, the company published a 66-page report on diversity at the institution, and it was focused on the Paris Opera Ballet. And this is the report that was prompted by the open letter that five Black members of the ballet company circulated last summer, which called for urgent change at an institution with a terrible track record on race. So unsurprisingly, the report found that the opera needs to do a lot more to promote diversity and inclusion. Following its release, Alexander Neef, who's the Paris Opera's director, vowed to pursue many of its recommendations, including eliminating racial caricature in its ballet repertoire. And while this is an important milestone to note, it's also all well-covered ground in the dance community generally, and also for us here on the podcast. Like, yes, of course, you should not have blackface and yellowface in your ballets. But we did want to talk about a few especially interesting and surprising things from the report and from Neef's response to it. Yeah, so first off, shout out to Laura Capel, who is a dance writer based in Paris, who has essentially was reporting all of this on Twitter before doing written reporting on it, uh, keeping us all apprised. So again, as Margaret covered, uh, eliminating blackface, brownface, and yellowface uh, from the repertoire, um, opening choreographic commissions to diverse choreographers. These are things that seem absolutely common sense that are now actually being formally recommended to this company that is historically slow to change. But Another thing that came up that was very interesting that uh, hasn't necessarily gotten a lot of press, but I think is fascinating, is the suggestion that POB reach out to high-level non-white artists in France and abroad to hire them into the corps de ballet in order to create role models. Uh, there is an argument that it's near impossible to imagine yourself as a person of color as being someone who could join the Paris Opera because there are so few Black artists and artists of color in the company. And if if implemented, that would be a huge change because the Paris Opera Ballet has for a long time refused to budge on its competition-based system of entry, which is very... It's incredibly insular. Yeah. Yeah, you, you come up through the school and then even getting promoted within the company is done through this very the, rigid... The concours. <laughs> yeah, the concours, which is a whole other thing to talk about. Um, and another thing was talking about like... Uh, loosening some of the rigid standards for admission into the school. Also, instead of waiting for, quote unquote, diverse students to come to the school to instead step up outreach efforts, um, do auditions outside of Paris. There is something Laura pointed out in her reporting reporting for Point is that this might potentially uh, rub the school director a little bit wrong, who has long maintained that they are doing enough and doing plenty. So we're curious to see what the implementation is going to look like, uh, because a lot of the report really did focus on uh, essentially the school company pipeline. I thought another thing Laura mentioned was that even within the company, this implementation may be challenging. Uh, less than 300 of the Paris Opera employees out of around 1,500 signed the letter and manifesto last summer, and some even went so far as to publicize their reluctance on social media. I mean, so that's there's a bigger picture context here in that some people in France are seeing these changes as part of a larger scale, oh, I hate this term, but culture war that American theories on race and gender and post-colonialism are posing this kind of existential threat to French identity. And notably, this isn't just like Marine Le Pen saying this. Macron is on this bandwagon. Like this, He's said these things. And I, my reaction to that is that I'm actually kind of tickled by the idea of like wokeness as an American cultural export. <laughs> like some of that to offset the mercenary capitalist ideas and like virulent strains of racism that we're also pumping out into the world. Sure. Let's that's you know what? I'm on board. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a different point, but I did think it was interesting that there was no actual data as to the different races of dancers in the company available, I guess because racial statistics are strongly discouraged in France, which goes back to some of the reason that people are so resistant to the recommendations made in this report. I guess because France is so very focused on this idea of egalité, it results in this colorblind societal ideal where you just kind of erase all of those differences. Which is sort of like a 90s way of seeing the world. Like, I feel like this is what a lot of us learned in school growing up, this colorblind approach. We don't talk about race because we've moved past it. And obviously, we have not. Anyway, it's encouraging that Neef immediately pledged to implement a lot of the recommendations made in the report. Very eager to see more of that work being done going forward. 
So in our next segment, we're going to talk about a very different corner of the ballet universe. Uh, Last week, the New York Times published a piece about ballet TikTok, where young dancers are finding a space to talk about the really deep-seated problems in ballet that feels authentic and real. And full disclosure, I wrote this story. So I'm going to stop talking here in an effort to not completely take over this conversation, because obviously I have a lot to say about it. But it was a really good story, though. Yeah, I mean, I have to say I was so delighted not only to see someone who is so near and dear to me writing this fabulous story for the Times, but also just by the content being covered in this, because I think I have seen this trend developing both in like ballet meme Instagram circles and now on TikTok of Gen Z taking the ballet world to task in a way that is critical and intelligent and important and are all conversations that I wish had been occurring when I was part of the dance world. But essentially, if you're not on Ballet TikTok, first of all, join it. It's fun and an excellent use of slash waste of your time. But it's you really looking at me, Cadence, and the answer is no. <laughs> I, I'm not going to cave to TikTok. I'm not going to do it. Well, if you're not familiar with the whole TikTok culture, I think something that we're starting to see is Gen Z taking both kind of a self-deprecating perspective, but also a critical lens to a lot of institutions, um, using humor to kind of analyze uh, outdated institutions and the issues that come with them. And we are starting to see that on Ballet TikTok, where young dancers are confronting issues that they see in the dance world, be it body image issues or um, issues of race and equity or even issues of financial limitations on dancers, all of these different things they are tackling in a way that is somehow both funny and critical. And it's it's really amazing to see. And that's why I just loved reading this article so much and seeing the conversations that are happening on the app because they're really important. I mean, I was, you know, I did use this discussion as an excuse to spend a good portion of my morning scrolling ballet TikTok. And it seems like this week, one thing that people are, dancers are really talking about is the old dance teacher adage of, I can see your lunch to young dancers. And I mean, excellent discussion point. Let's talk about that. Let's break that down and explain exactly why it's so wrong. But I think it's just, I wish that when I was a young dancer and my ballet teacher told me to pull in my stomach like roughly 20 times in one class, there had been a place for me to discuss that and have that conversation with my peers. And I love seeing it now on TikTok. Well, and I think what's wonderful about it, right, is that it's also so very clearly coming from a place of like loving this art form Mm -hmm. and caring about it, but also in loving it, not letting that blind you to what's problematic about it, what's Mm -hmm. harmful about it. And by, you know, we've said it a lot here, like by being able to discuss that more openly, we can actually create a changing culture, we hope, going forward. And I, and also humor is a wonderful way to actually go about having those conversations because it's like oh yeah it hurts but also I'm laughing hysterically because I relate to this so much but it's like it's that in is there Mm -hmm. and dancers dancers are so funny (laughs) I mean the a little backstory on this story I first pitched the idea after just being endlessly frustrated trying to watch Tiny Pretty Things and being like, why can't we just talk about about ballet, about the way it actually feels to be a ballet dancer, which is that mixture of like hilarity and despair. And it's, yeah, essentially the right type of tone for a show is tromedy. Like it's, that's where we live as actual dancers And then thinking about where does that actually exist? And TikTok. TikTok is the place where it exists. Anyway, we don't need to talk too much about this. I did want to say one sort of fabulous bit of fallout from the piece, which was Jennifer McCloskey, who's the um, dancer behind Hardcore Ballet. I saw this. (laughs) She had this amazing quote in the piece uh, saying that she doesn't come to TikTok to watch Isabella Boylston do eight pirouettes. She thinks that's kind of boring. TikTok content is more creative. (laughs) And she posted to her TikTok account after the story came out, like me realizing I just shaded one of the preeminent ballet dancers of our generation and like hiding her face. And then Isabella commented on the post, like, no worries, not the first bad review I've gotten in the New York Times, which just like another another reason to love ballet TikTok that this type of discourse is happening. So many reasons. Also, bless Bella. Just <laughs> bless her. Bless, bless everybody involved. Um. All right. So in the last part of our roundtable conversation, we're going to talk about the weekend Super Bowl halftime show because 
For a performance that involved relatively little, like, dancey dancing, it elicited a pretty wide range of responses from dance people. Some thought its pedestrian quality and the, the elegant way that it incorporated masks was kind of brilliant. Others were frustrated by the fact that, of course, we could only get a large-scale dance anything right now in the context of a professional sporting event. It was almost like a Rorschach test, like what you saw in that Super Bowl show was a reflection of what you were feeling more broadly about the dance world or the world world. Well, and something that that struck me watching the choreography was I definitely had the thought of like, am I watching a case of limitations fostering creativity? Uh, Mm Because a lot of the choreography, um, especially in the opening section where like only the top half of the dancer's bodies were visible, it was very gestural. Uh, I had the thought like, oh, you could so easily rehearse this on Zoom. And like in a lot of (laughs) ways, it's like reflecting a lot of Zoom choreography you see, like everyone's just faces next to each other in a grid. It was definitely interesting and it definitely felt like something that was a product of this really, really weird moment that we're in. And I say moment like we're not 10 months into it. Oh, God. (laughs) I think 11 at this point. Uh, It's officially 11. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) I... I mean, I have to say, for me, I was a little underwhelmed by this. I felt like there were missed opportunities. Like, for me, honestly, a big missed opportunity. And I'm going to mention TikTok again. So, Courtney, you can quietly roll your eyes. But I just feel like, um, why would you not use the blinding lights TikTok choreography? I loved Doja Cat incorporating the Say So choreo into the music video and into her performance at, I think, the VMAs. And it just felt like, really? You're going to do blinding lights, have all the dancers there, and just miss that chance? For the record, I have no issue with TikTok. I just know it will take over my life if I get one. Don't <laughs> at <fair>. me, guys. <laughs> That's fair. That's noted. That's noted on the record. I, You know what's funny, Cadence, is that I had that same feeling. I was like, they're going to do it. They're about to do it. They're going to do it. They're going to do the blinding lights challenge. And they and never they did didn't. it. But my response was, oh, that's sort of brilliant. Kind of taking us right up to the edge. Everyone who knows what it is understands that there's almost a reference happening, but not actually going there. I don't know. I love that kind of play. I'm a Leo, so I like things to be direct, and I would have liked the <laughs> choreo. Um, I, I do have to say, the the thing that really got me, though, was seeing all the memes uh, and even a couple of reposted TikToks that were essentially like, there are 25,000 people watching the Super Bowl live. Do the arts know? Do they, <laughs> do they know that this is happening? And I felt that yeah. in my soul. Hurt a little. I mean, I... I felt that too. I will say, though, my biggest overall takeaway was I kept thinking about how many dancers were getting paid for this performance. Mm. And I had this feeling that Charm LaDonna, who choreographed it, who's also brilliant, I just pictured her saying, all right, how can I get as many dancers paid as possible and make it work given the limitations that we have in terms of rehearsal time and space? So I hope they all made really good money. And I hope they are all still safe and healthy. Yes. I think we all have some concerns. (laughs) Well, at least they were aggressively masked. Aggressively which also, that masked. was another another kind of yeah elegant yeah, that was solution. Some cool costuming. Yeah. All right, we are way over time, so we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll have our interview with Tamisha Guy. Stay tuned. The Pillow Voices Dance Through Time podcast brings listeners closer to notable personalities connected with Jacob's Pillow from 1933 to today. Each episode brings treasures from the Pillow archives to life, sharing rarely heard recordings alongside personal stories and perspectives from leading artists, thought leaders, and innovators. Jacob's Pillow, lauded by the New York Times as the dance center of the nation, is a national historic landmark. It's a recipient of the prestigious National Medal of the Arts, and of course, it's home to America's longest running international dance festival. So be sure to listen to their podcast at pillowvoices.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, dance friends. We are here today with Tamisha Guy. Hi, Tamisha. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Thank you for having me. Tamisha is a dancer in Kyle Abraham's AIM and an adjunct professor at SUNY Purchase. She dances and teaches all over the world. But actually, I'm going to stop there because, Tamisha, I'm hoping you can get us started by telling our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your relationship with dance. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Tamisha Guy. I am originally from Trinidad, um, and I moved to New York in 1998 with my family. And 
Um, I didn't really know much about dance, honestly. I was more of a track and field um, girl. I did gymnastics as well. Um, but my family and I moved uh, to New York in 1998, and I sort of fell into dance, I like to say. Um, I started to train at Valley Tech, New York City Public School for dance. And then I went to LaGuardia High School and then SUNY Purchase College, where I majored in dance and arts management. And then after graduation, um, I started dancing with the Martha Graham Dance Company just for a short period of time. And then I started with AIM by Cal Abraham, where I'm still a current member. And actually, as we speak, you are finishing up a residency with AIM at Kotzban, right? Yes, we are. Can you talk a little about that residency, what the company has been working on and and what it's all been like? Yeah, sure. So we've been here for 21 days so far. So 21 out of the 28 days that we're going to be here on this residency. Um, And it's just a time for us to, you know, get together and to work a bit more closely just within, you know, guidelines and protocol that we set forth um, for this uh, engagement. But it's been really great just to be in space with my colleagues to be able to, you know, touch the dancers again. Um, and of course, we did a lot of testing prior to coming here. And um, we've been getting tested every week as well as we've been here. So we've been, we're being very careful. Um, but just being able to work on, you know, pieces that we may have um, started to work on prior to COVID and just getting back into it has been really nice and diving even deeper into it has been really great as well. Um, So yeah, we're getting into the thick of it. We're coming down to the final few days here, Um, but we've been rehearsing each day and yeah, it's just been a lot of dancing, a lot of uh, conversations as well, you know, checking in to sort of see where we are, um, just considering all of the happenings in the world, but it's been definitely, um, I think, a a great experience, I would say for me, just to be in space um, with my colleagues and Kyle and um, just sort of feeling what a creative process um, is and can be again. And we actually had Kyle back on the podcast back in November, and he was talking about specifically Untitled, the D'Angelo piece that you're working on. So it was great to hear his perspective as a choreographer. Can you talk a little about that process from your dancer's perspective? Because is that one of the dances you've been working on? Yeah, yeah. So we're actually working on, I believe, three works um, while we're here. So Untitled, Love, which is set to D'Angelo's music. We're working on a newer work. Um, and then another <laughs> new work as well. So a lot of dance is happening here. But in terms of working on Entitled, it's a piece I think we've been working on now for a little over two years. So we've sort of been in the midst of this piece for a really long time. And I think now that we've been given this time at Kotzbahn, there's been a lot of sort of like, you know, reworkings of things, sort of taking things out and um just digging even deeper into what we want the piece to say and what um, what we sort of want to uh, continue to develop. And the piece is about Black love. So um, I think in this season as well, it's been really beautiful to sort of like be focused on that, you know, and, and sort of talking about Black love and all of its um, beauty. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been nice. A lot of smiling, a lot of laughs, um, <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. You were referencing the time that you've been at Kotzban has been such an eventful time in the world at large, and especially in the United States. Has any of that seeped into, I mean, I know you've had discussions about that with your fellow company members, but has that seeped into the work itself at all? I would say at the moment, not so much. Um, I think you know, within AIM, we're super um, collaborative. So we have the freedom to sort of bring our own life experiences into the work. And I would say, you know, it's very hard to sort of see what's happening in the world and not sort of feel any of that while you're in the studio, um, dancing with people that sort of um, may share in the same experiences as you. So I would say personally, I've been definitely thinking about the happenings in the world and trying to let that sort of be an inspiration or guide. Um, um, and a, it's been it's been challenging at times because I think, you know, everything is not all sort of dandy um, in the world right now. But 
just being able to sort of be in a space and have that freedom to express and to explore has been really um, beautiful. Um, but, you know, I'm sure once sort of COVID is behind us and as we dive into other processes that um, s- some things are going to seep in there, you know, because I feel like we, as artists, we have to talk about what's going on in the world. Like we, we have to talk about that in our art. And I think I can definitely see that happening in the future. Yeah. Because no art exists in a bubble, even a beautiful COVID bubble. Exactly. So in addition to the work you've been doing with AIM, you've also been collaborating with artists all over the world during quarantine. You've been so busy. Can you talk a little about some of the highlights of that work and the dance projects that you sort of have cooking right now? Sure. So... You know, I, I like to say, um, although this time has been super tumultuous, I think it's definitely afforded me the opportunity to reach out to artists and um, collaborators that I've been wanting to work with. So I've been really um, just fortunate to work with a good friend of mine, Damani Pompey, who I met in high school, and he's now a director, movement director, like he basically does it all. Um, and I approached him to sort of come up with a project that talks about how we relate to nature um, as human beings. And he came up with a project called Crust and it's sort of exploring those ideas. So we actually recorded it maybe two or three weeks ago and I'm really excited to sort of share it and um, to see it as well. Cause I think, you know, being in the process you're sort of like focused on how everything looks but um, I'm excited to sort of see how the film comes together. Um, so that's one of the projects that I've been working on. And I also collaborated with um, Room to Room, which is a project by Ana Maria Lucacci and Katarina Cavallo. And it's basically the project is bringing artists together from all over the world, um, sort of pairing people together to collaborate on a project. And I worked with uh, Keelan Whitmore, who is a former Alonzo King's Lines dancer. Um, and it was just a beautiful experience. You know, we worked for Zoom. We had multiple rehearsals and we hadn't known each other prior to, um, this sort of, um, project. So it was nice to sort of get to know an artist that I hadn't known before. And we sort of had a number of similarities. So it was nice to, um, just sort of have that connection with someone, um, And that project we also recorded three weeks or so ago. So I'm also excited to sort of see that come together. And that was all recorded in my home and my family's home. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm excited. I'm just excited to see it come together. And both works are really personal to me. So, um, yeah, I look forward to seeing them. It's so interesting how during the pandemic, It's like all this work that people are making is sort of fundamentally abstract in that most of the time we're apart from each other and working on Zoom. But then it's also incredibly personal because we're in our home spaces and so much of it comes from you being in that environment. Yeah, it's fascinating to see that all unfold. Exactly. Yeah. Um, So you're also, as we mentioned, a professor at SUNY Purchase and you also teach at Gibney. What drew you to teaching specifically and how would you describe your teaching philosophy? Sure. So I didn't start teaching um, until I joined AIM. So in AIM, we often have opportunities to teach master classes when we go on tour. And once I joined the company and I probably was like a year in, I started like teaching company classes when we traveled and I just really took a liking to it. I love um, just motivating people and it sort of offered that for me. Um, and also I love just seeing, you know, dancers, um, participants, whomever takes my classes. I just love seeing them sort of get it, whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be getting the step, but just the feeling that sort of comes out of, of that um, realization of them actually like feeling something that I shared with them. Um, so that sort of is what started the the fire in me to teach. Um, and I've been teaching, I think, throughout my years here at AIM. And I wanted to sort of find my own voice in teaching because usually when we're teaching the AIM master classes, it has that um, sort of Kyle aesthetic in there. So I was really eager and interested in sort of finding my own voice in um, 
teaching, you know, what qualities I wanted to sort of um, pull out um, of the participants and what I sort of wanted to be um, my own choreographic voice in a sense. So I started just sort of um, reaching out places just to teach classes um, and a number of places also reached out to me. So that's sort of how it started. And now I, I think I'm, I'm getting, you know, more comfortable for sure, I could say with teaching and um, with sort of um, just getting, you know, more um, deepening my exchange with students. I think that's what's really important to me is just that exchange, like learning from the students and then also learning from me, because I think that teaching isn't one sided, you know, and um, I'm learning just as much from my students as I believe they and I hope that they are learning from me as well. You talked about finding your voice as a teacher. How would you describe that voice? I know it's always evolving, but how would you describe it? Yeah, so for me, I love to say that I, once I'm teaching, I'm sort of giving you the structure. So I'm giving you the skeleton of the phrase, the movement phrase, and then I just encourage students to sort of approach each step with clarity and confidence. Like that is honestly like my spiel. Um, and, you know, once I'm sort of talking to them, I, I share just like certain textures and qualities that they can sort of tap into and explore. But I think it's also less about the students trying to move in the way that I move, but trying to also find their own unique voice within my movement. One of the reasons I was really eager to have you on the podcast is because the teaching that you do extends beyond the dance studio. And I'm really intrigued by, you have this idea to put together budgeting and financial planning workshops for dancers. Can you talk about what inspired that and what you're envisioning? Yes. So I started teaching at Purchase Fall of 2020, and I had conversations with the students just asking them what they needed in this time. You know, I think it had to go beyond just me teaching a class to them, you know, so I think I was really interested in having conversations and asking them what they felt um, could be a benefit to them in this season um, with COVID and just, you um, outside of just movement uh, and I'm teaching the senior class. So I also had in mind that they are now, you know, preparing to graduate. So what do you need to feel safe and secure in the professional world? And that was something that was really important to me to ask of them or to ask them. And, you know, I just started having conversations. I asked them questions about budgeting. It's like, do you know the basics of budgeting? No. Okay. Do you know about taxes? No. Okay. So then I knew of someone that sort of taught a budgeting for dancers workshop. So I brought that person in to teach the dancers a workshop. And then my mom is luckily an accountant and is a genius with finances. So I brought her in to teach a tax seminar to the students as well. And that was sort of the initial, um, you know, reasoning for me wanting to offer this to the students and now sort of wanting to curate a program where that is offered to pre-professional and professional dancers. Because I think even dancers who are well into their career, they may not have this knowledge as well. Um, so I'm still sort of thinking of how to curate it, but I definitely want it to be a program that fosters dance and also gives you knowledge on sort of financial literacy and you know, helping dancers feel more secure in their finances. Because I think the mindset of the starving artists has sort of never sat well with me. And if I can help, you know, my community in any way, I, I definitely want to, to do that and work towards that. Yeah, this idea that the artists should suffer for their art, and that means financially too? No, no, let's stop no. that. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a theme that we come back to periodically on this podcast because dancers, even in wonderful college programs like SUNY Purchase has an incredible dance program and they get this fantastic artistic education. But even in that kind of dance program, yeah, there's this big hole where it's like, how do you craft a sustainable career? And that includes budgeting. That includes doing your taxes. Yeah. Exactly. It does. So 
You yourself are juggling all these different projects right now, but it seems, at least from the outside, it seems like you're navigating this previously unthinkable pandemic scenario very gracefully. Has the pandemic changed the way you think about your dance career at all? Yeah, so I'd like to say that I think COVID sort of ignited this like effluence of consciousness and awareness. Um, and it's sort of pushing us all to live a bit more um, intentionally, you know? Um, and I think prior to COVID, I, I would categorize myself as a very like aware person. Um, I, you know, I like to be present <laughs> um, and to sort of be in each moment um, as they arise. And I think it's just helped me to deepen into that even more, to deepen into that awareness and I think I'm approaching my dance career with a bit more care and awareness. Um, and I think it, it sort of, it boils down to knowing that my career is in my hands in a sense, you know, it's like, I can choose to take this path. I can choose to take another path, but at the end of the day, it's sort of up to me how I want it to go. And I think, that awareness has definitely um, come to be a bit more in this season. Like just knowing that I have and I am in control of, of um, where I want to go um, in my career. So I'm, I'm grateful for this sort of awakening for sure. Um, you know, and although it's it's been tumultuous as I've shared, I think there are definitely, there's a blessing within it all still. Yeah. yeah, it seems like it's forced all of us as individuals to be a lot more thoughtful. And we're seeing signs that that might also be true for institutions. Like, I'm really hopeful that that's also going to be true, especially in the dance world, that institutions will get to rethink their processes. And that kind of ties into my next question for you, which is just to get your perspective on this. What dance world problems have you personally seen the pandemic kind of lay bare? And then on the other side of that, how have you seen this challenge unify or strengthen the dance community? So I think there's been this huge shift. And, you know, I think as artists, we've sort of been on this like productivity train where it's just been going nonstop and we haven't had time to sort of really assess what we are doing. <laughs> you know, it's like I go to rehearsal, I rehearse for a number of hours a day, I go home, I cook. I sleep, I do it all over again. And I think this time has sort of forced us all to slow down and to sort of take a look at our lives and take a look at, I think, areas that need improving and not only within our own personal lives, but within our in the institutions that we work for. I think this time has sort of, the shift has been beautiful to see, I think for me, because I think a lot of dancers are now advocating more for themselves and for others, I think to have more equity within these institutions, to have better working conditions, to have safer working conditions and to have more benefits, you know? Um, so I've, it's been beautiful to see that. And I think in terms of community, I feel that we're just all as artists just coming together and in support of one another. And I just pray and I'm hopeful as well that that sort of energy stays with us um, once, you know, COVID is a memory. <laughs> um, I'm just praying that it definitely stays with us because I think there's this, um, as I shared, this sort of new awareness, like care and thoughtfulness that we're sort of um, moving through the world with, I think, as artists. And even in the way that we communicate with each other, I'm seeing um, a, a difference in as well. Um, so I would just encourage artists to continue using your voice. You know, um, I think people who are running these institutions, they, I think they've seen the value in having artists, of course, be a part of their institutions because, you know, you need the institution, you need, you need the artist in order to, you know, have things, um, moving forward but I think there's this new I hope there's this new appreciation for just what both 
parties are bringing to the table, but more so what the artists have brought to the table and continue to bring to the table. Um, yeah, it's yeah. hopefully artists are figuring out what their voices are and how to use them effectively. And then institutions are hopefully starting to hear those voices. Right. Yeah, right. totally. Right. Yeah. Well, there do seem to be some glimmers of hope on the pandemic front. So what are you most looking forward to, dance-wise, otherwise, once the pandemic is behind us? Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. I'm going to utter those same words. Um, I think I'm looking forward to, I think, a community that I feel more proud of for younger artists to be a part of. And I am proud in this present moment of the community that, that I'm a part of, for sure. But I think there's more work that we need to do to ensure that younger artists are entering a safer and um, more equitable um, community. And I think personally, I am just eager to start this workshop um, for artists with, you know, dance and financial literacy so I'm definitely going to be working towards that and I also have some other like entrepreneurial um, ventures that I'm looking into as well so just continuing to grow and to be more aware more present <laughs> in my life um, and I'm just looking forward to you know a time where we may not have to do a bubble residency and get away from <laughs> you know, New York for a long period of time and sort of be able to be where we are and share space safely with one another. Um, yeah, I think I'm just remaining hopeful. You know, I think that is what I'm holding on to. And that's what's definitely helped me in this season to sort of maintain my peace. Um, talking about making a better future for these students who are coming up. I don't mean to project onto you, but I've been watching On Point, the documentary about young students at the School of American Ballet. And I remember thinking, watching it, I hope we can fix dance so it doesn't break you because you're so wonderful right now. Like, do you do you feel those same feelings watching your students I, too? I feel that completely, um, completely. And I often get emotional because I, I just want it to be better. <laughs> simply put, you know, um, because they deserve it. Yeah. And it's our job to fix it. And it, it does seem like at least we know that. And at least we're taking steps in that yes. direction, like especially with this COVID kick in the butt. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, Tamisha. Thank you so much. Before we sign off, where can listeners go to find out more about these two projects that you have about to premiere and then also about the other work that you're doing? Yes. Yeah, so I will have those projects on my website soon. Um, and my website is TamishaGuy.com. You can also find me on social media, on Instagram, just Tamisha Guy. Just everything is Tamisha Guy if you want to get in contact with me. Great. And we'll include links to all of those in our episode description just to make things easier for people too. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tamisha. And thank you. Stay Martha. warm. We're in the middle of the snow apocalypse as we record. <laughs> I hope you survive okay up there at Kotspan. Thank you so much. I'm wishing you a beautiful day and a great week. One more big thanks to Tamisha, who is back in New York City now. She actually just posted a beautiful series of Snapchats and videos from the AIM residency on her Instagram. Be sure to take a look at that. And stay tuned for more information on her financial planning workshops. We will keep you posted on those. They sound fantastic. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Bye, everyone. The 
The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those football sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.